do it. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis, and today we've got Dr. Robert Lethem on the other line, and we are going to be discussing the Trinity. Really excited. Uh, we were able to talk Dr. Lethem out of Pentecost and talk him into, not that he's talked <laughs> out of it. Talk him out of Pentecost. I'll let, I'll, I'll let him explain. I'm cool with Pentecost, but we're, we're going to expand it from one person of the Trinity and that's pouring <laughs> out of the three. Holy Spirit to there all three go. persons. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, this is going to be an exciting episode. But because this is pretty much the world's the expert. leading expert on the Trinity. According to Scott Harrell, there are no experts, but if there was one, it's this guy. So I'm right. looking forward to it. So we're going to uh, talk Trinity. I love, yeah. I love Dr. Harrell. But if you're new to Remnant Radio, if you don't know what we're about, we're a theology broadcast. We stream uh, Monday nights at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we stream on Tuesdays from 4 to 5. So uh, we also have lots of other live streams outside of those scheduled times. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so that you get content just like this. Uh, we are a theology broadcast. So we kind of try to suspend our presuppositions momentarily and interview people uh, in different churches in different denominations. Uh, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, the whole nine. So if that's something that you're interested in, learning from Christian brothers that might agree or disagree with you, this would be the channel for you. Hit subscribe and like as this is promised to be an exciting content uh michael catch us up on the stuff that we've done just this week it's tuesday it's tuesday and this is our fourth show which yeah. is pretty unusual for us we usually are at about two shows a week and sometimes three uh but this week's been a little crazy uh we had uh, dr peter lightheart on the show uh mm -hmm. he talked about the 10 commandments just answering questions like why are there 10 why is it five plus five and and what does that mean and and just how do they all tie together answering just a lot of questions about the ten commandments very insightful dr storms uh sam storms was also on this week and uh just a few hours after that <laughs> and talking about spiritual gifts all things just apostleship prophecy uh and just kind of a lot of the gifts people have questions about very just articulate, well studied, and uh, you'll certainly benefit from that. Last of all, we had Dr. Uh, ben Witherington, the third on the show, talking about Arminianism. I know how you guys love to talk soteriology, which reminds me next week we're having a debate between a Calvinist and a provisionist, and it's going to be live and in person. I'm going to make a, a big deal out of it. In fact, if you're in the DFW area, send Remnant Radio an email and we'll uh we might be able to do something in person for you so yeah and we've got other interviews that are coming down the pipe that you can actually see in the youtube thumbnail sections of upcoming videos we'll have interviews with jeff durbin we have interviews with todd white we've got interviews uh coming down the pipe with uh geez louise uh, the bible project tim mackey uh yeah. so talk about diverse it's going to be a ride in the next couple of months but without further ado dr latham tell us a little about yourself and your ministry for people who might not be aware well, I'm a Presbyterian minister. <clears throat> I've uh, had 25 years pastoral experience, lived in the USA for 28 years, which I'm sure you can tell by my accent. I'm, although I'm from the UK, um, my wife's American. We have three children, two daughters, one son, and uh, two daughters have f uh, a total of four children between them, two girls and two boys. And uh, we have a son, too. So. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm professor of systematic and historical theology at Union Theological S School, School of Theology in Wales. And okay. I've been there for, what, 14 years, I think, something yeah. like that. And don't you have a systematic theology book that maybe recently come out, came out? That's right. Crossway put it out yeah. last November. November. So. Okay. Uh, so you have a systematic theology book. And then uh, tell us about some of your other writings. Well, I've written a book for IVP on the work of Christ and one on the person of Christ. Uh, I've written books on the Lord's Supper and on baptism, on union with Christ, um, two editions of my book on the Trinity, one on the Westminster Assembly, and I'm writing one at the moment on the Holy Spirit. Uh, for various public publishers, Crossway, IVP, uh, Presbyterian and Reformed are the main ones. And also, oh, there's also one on Eastern Orthodoxy, too, with uh, Christian Focus publications. Have you been able to write more with Corona, with all the lockdown? Because I've talked to a couple of guys, they're like, I love lockdown. I just get to write all day and no one bugs me. Like, Have you, have you been able to write more? It's superb. Absolutely is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I love all the all, all the pastors are like dying because they're so social, and all the yeah. academic theologians are like, I love this. Um, yeah. it, it's it's yeah. a beautiful thing. It's a, it's <laughs> except I I live in Texas and people are like, what's a lockdown? So <laughs> yeah, there's that too. <laughs> I'm like busier than ever. I actually have like online church and in person church, and I, it's like I have two congregations I'm serving, so it's actually quite busy for me. <laughs> hey, so let's let's dive into the subject of the Trinity. You you again, where would where would be the best place for us to start? Since you have uh, uh, such proficiency in the subject of the Trinity, uh, we we hear about it constantly growing up in church. Uh, statistics tell us people are very uncomfortable talking about the Trinity because they're afraid of being heretics, uh, but uh, they're not really well equipped in articulating the Trinity. So what would be the best place for us to start in our discussion today? Uh, probably um, you start with baptism because we are all baptized into the one name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So consequently, it's something which is common to all Christians and therefore foundational to the whole faith. And if we're to ask the question, uh, what do we believe or in whom do we believe? We believe in God, who has revealed himself to us in his son, Jesus Christ, and by his spirit has brought us to faith. So therefore, the Trinity is absolutely pervasive. I mean, Paul says that through Christ, we both Jew and Gentile have access by one spirit to the Father, in Ephesians 2. So he's talking there about our access to God, prayer, worship, and so on, which is inherently Trinitarian. And so as uh, it's, it's kind of the atmosphere we breathe, we might say, as Christians. And indeed, if you were to ask, uh, what is it we worship? Well, Jesus said that uh, uh, the, the Father seeks worshippers to worship him in spirit and in truth now truth in john's gospel from which that citation comes john has already used it to refer to jesus christ um, grace the law was given by moses grace and truth came through jesus christ and he records jesus as saying later on i am the way the truth and the life and every reference I would suggest bar just two or three in, in the Gospel of John to uh, pneuma, which it means spirit, is to the Holy Spirit. So in fact, Jesus is saying that the Father seeks people to worship him in the Holy Spirit and in his son, Jesus Christ, the truth. Uh, so worship is inherently Trinitarian. So yeah, it, it's difficult, it's dangerous, there are many dangers on all sides, and even skilled theologians can fall into serious problems. So, yes, I, I agree that it's a, it's a matter for huge care. And for the ordinary Christian, the point is to confess it and to pray in, and worship in that light. Uh, we're not all called on to make uh, um, rarefied uh, meta-theoretical -theo theological statements but we are all called to worship God um, Amen. I think Amen. Amen. that's good so <clears throat> it, as you're discussing like it, you know even very skilled theologians can err significantly in this and I know that the early church that uh, that as the creeds began to come out <clears throat> excuse me I gotta clear my throat here uh, I wonder if you could just talk us through the development of those creeds and or, or really in those creeds and how they uh, how they came about the Nicene Creed yep. the Chalcedonian Creed and what they helped us understand uh, or what they uh, sort of confirm for us about the Trinity yeah yeah well in the in the first few centuries of the Christian Church there were two major problems which faced it and indeed still do to a great extent one was simply to affirm that God's revelation in human history as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were in fact simply three ways, three modes, three forms in which the one God made himself known and that they therefore did not represent who God is eternally. Uh, they were simply like roles 
which an actor would take on at different times in different places. Now, that was known as modalism. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that if that were true, then God's revelation in human history would not represent who he eternally is. And therefore, we would not have the true knowledge of God. On the other hand, uh, there was the idea that somehow, uh, the, while the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are distinct, nevertheless, the Son and the Spirit are somehow less in uh, being and in, in status than the Father. And if you really want to, talk, to know who God is, he is, he is one mo uh, sort of unitary being with the Son and the Holy Spirit a dis dif distinct or as one a notorious figure Arius in the early fourth century maintained different beings now that was called subordinationism and so the church when these ideas were, were brought about realized that if either of them were true we would not have a true knowledge of God and indeed we could not be saved Salvation mm. requires Jesus Christ to be one with God. And indeed, it's the Holy Spirit who grants us faith and unites us to Christ, they argued, must be God in order to do so. If either the Son or the Holy Spirit were less than God, Jesus could not say, to, uh, for example, in the Gospel of John, to Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, it would not only put a question mark over the identity of God, but it would undermine the gospel. So the church had to, be, to confront that, and it did so. I mentioned Arius, who was uh, who effectively held that the Son was created, and mm -hmm. also too with the Holy Spirit. Uh, it took a lot of a real tussle, several decades, to finally to work things out. And, and, and one of the problems was to be able to articulate how it is to be understood that God is one and indivisible while simultaneously being in three distinct, um, how, I would use the word mode, modes of subsistence, which really means three distinct personal um, realities which are distinct eternally but yet one in being excellent so as so i'm as, as i'm hearing you and i'm, I'm listening to uh kind of how you're articulating the trinity and then the back uh, drop of some of our fo our former episodes just recently we've done episodes on chalcedon we've done episodes on or chalcedon i always always pronounce i prefer the ch <laughs> anyway uh and then the uh the the nicene creed we've discussed uh with dr scott harrell eternal subordinationism and in that interview we talk about the difference between uh what is historically subordinationism and the functional subordination of the sun and how those are two separate doctrines uh, when we talk about heresy uh for those who are watching and they're like well this sounds like something that happened a really long time ago. Y'all keep talking about the stuff that happened in the, the second, the third, the fourth century, uh, but, but how is this relevant today? C can, can you unpack today for us what would be modern modalism or modern Arianism and how that begins to resurface and why it's really important that we be aware of the Trinitarian doctrines? Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps subordinate, um, yeah, um, put it this way. Um, somebody comes knocking at your door, there's two of them together, they probably have briefcases, and you get to talk, and you realize they're Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses are an extreme form of Arianism, and they, of course, they emerged in, uh, I think it was Pennsylvania, wasn't it, in the 19th century. They, they wanted to base everything which they uh, believed and taught on the Bible only and rejected the, the the teachings the councils of the early church but they've actually revived a rather extreme form of Arianism um, so these things are alive unfortunately and well and they resurface very much from time to time now on the popular level of the uh, man or woman in, in, in the church in the pew if you have still have pews um, 
often people tend to be practical modalists by the fact that precisely because of the fear which they have, which you mentioned earlier about getting into very deep waters over the, over the Trinity, they simply talk about God or the Lord, but without any coherent um, grasp of exactly what this may mean. Um, now, I think those are those are a couple of examples of how that 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 problem can in fact arise. I mean, it, the, the, it, it surfaces from time to time down through the history of the church. And in, in these teachings, these kind of resurfacing um, help us understand. Because again, we, we we see the church saying uh, modalism is an incorrect articulation. Arianism is an incorrect articulation, but in saying that, they go beyond saying this is incorrect or this is bad. They label it as heresy. Yeah. Um, they say it's an us and them. This is they're not a part of the Christian faith because they get this wrong. Can you unpack for us why those who would hold an Arian position or a modalistic position that these individuals would actually be considered not Christian? Yes. Well, it, it raises the distinction between error and heresy. Error means simply being wrong on a particular point. So, for example, the question, should infant children of believers be baptized? Now, you either say they should or they shouldn't. And it's difficult to see how both could be correct simultaneously. There's issues such as that where obviously one side may well be correct and the other's not, but it doesn't really affect too much of Christian faith, except, of course, for your doctrine of the church and some other very practical things, too. It has implications. Now, heresy is something more than error. It is an error, but it's something which, if it were true, would falsify the Christian faith. So, in other words, it is, it's the difference between a virus which can debilitate you for a while, but you'll get you, you you'll probably get better over it. And one which is deadly and can kill you. Uh, her heresy is a deadly virus, and it's deadly because for reasons I've pointed out. Modalism, it would not be a true knowledge of God that we had because the Son and the Holy Spirit. God's revelation as such would not be true because eternally, mm. according to modalism, he'd be other than what he revealed himself to us in human history. And subordinationism, if the son was less in status or being than God, he could not save us. Um, and similarly, the Holy Spirit would not be able to unite us to Christ. We'd have no gospel to proclaim. And for example, if the Son, in becoming incarnate, did not uh, take into union an integral human per uh, personality, uh, body and soul, we could not be saved. Because human, as uh, man had sinned in Adam, and therefore it required another man uh, to take Adam's place and to obey God where Adam had disobeyed. And without that, we could not be saved. So heresy is something which really goes to the heart of the heart of the gospel and uh, like a deadly virus uh, would eat it up and destroy it. So, so that's really how serious both modalism that's and subordinationism are. I like that. Josh and I were just talking about before the show. How do we talk about, because there, there are so many uh, times when it's like, you know, we've got Pelagianism, then semi-Pelagianism, or uh, even on this uh, on the issue, you've you've talked about subordinationism, and uh, and it's a it's a debate about uh, and as you know, I'm not informing you, but <laughs> for our viewers, uh, the eternal subordination of the Son. We talked about that last week with Dr. Scott Harrell, and uh, and there are some, uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Bruce Ware and Wayne Grudem. Where, where they have where they're saying the son has been and will be eternally submitted to the father at, at eternal sub, uh, subordination of the son and others say no that's uh, that's heresy and they're throwing words uh, they're, they're throwing the word heretic at uh, dr. Grudem and dr. Ware and so uh, and so how how should we maybe we'll actually just address that that very subject how should we talk about the subject of the eternal subordination of the son 
Um, well, firstly, we shouldn't talk about it. Uh, simple as that. Uh, there has been an, uh, a, a use of the word subordination by orthodox, um, with a small O, uh, theologians. Um, many of the reformed scholastics in the 17th and 18th century did so. Charles Hodge, in his systematic theology, taught at Princeton, he, he argued that the son is subordinate to the father in terms of his work in, in his incarnate state as man, and also in his manner of subsistence in the Trinity, in so far as his, the son is from the father. Now, Hodge was simply, and the others were using that term to denote what the early creeds had, had, had pointed out, that the son is begotten of the father from all ages, um, light of, from light, uh, God of God. In other words, that there is an order within the Trinity, whereas the Father generates the Son and breathes out the Spirit. And so in human history, the Father sends the Son, and the Father and the Son together send the Spirit. Um, the, these are known as processions, and Hodge and the others were using it in that sense. Now, the problem in more recent years, and I, I discussed this at at some length in the revi in the second edition of my book on the Trinity, which was published last year, uh, I have a, a quite an extended section there, is that there are two things which are vital to remember in the doctrine of the Trinity. One is the indivisibility of the Trinity, and that there is one indivisible will. So consequently, if there, were, if suppose there were three wills, suppose the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each had their own will, you would effectively have three gods. Um, the three are one in in that respect and cannot be divided. And in fact, in human history, they work together inseparably in all the works of God in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light. You can trace that actually in many different ways in Genesis 1. But it's true in the incarnation. The father sends the son conceived by the Holy Spirit. On the cross, the son offers himself up, Hebrews 9, through the eternal spirit to the father. In the resurrection, uh, Paul talks about the spirit of him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. The Father raises, raised Christ from the dead by the Spirit, the Son from the dead by the Spirit, and he goes on to say he will do the same to us. So the three work together inseparably because they're indivisible. So that's the one thing, the indivisibility of the will. And the second is the eternal generation of the, of the Son by the Father and indeed the spiration of the spirit. This was integral to the church's understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity because it was used to affirm two inseparable things. One is that the son is of the same identical nature as the father. I mean, the followers of Arius, you know, as you were walking down the street, they'd come up to you and they'd grab you by um, I was going to say the lapels of your jacket, but well, people don't wear jackets now, and they certainly didn't in the fourth century, but you get the idea. And, and they said, were you a father before you begot, begat your son? And the answer is, no, of course not. I became a father at that point. And said, well, that proves it. God was not a father before he generated the son. Now, what the Arians were doing was arguing from human contexts and human relationships back to God. And that, of course, is operating in the wrong direction. Um, it go the other way, because, as Paul says, God is the, is the one from whom every family on earth is named. No, the, the, the Orthodox said in reply, no, you're quite wrong. You're arguing in a different direction. What the generation of the son establishes is that the son is of the identical nature 
because fathers produce sons who are of the same nature, human nature in that case. So it, it was used to affirm that and simultaneously the distinction between the father and the son and in turn the Holy Spirit, that the father is not the same as the, identical to the son, although he is of the identical being to the son. Now, I think in some recent discussions, and I, I, don't, I don't like um, throwing names around because I think the issues are the most important thing. Two things have been said which tend to transgress both those boundaries. One is that some people opposed the doctrine of the eternal generation of the son on the grounds that they did not see it in the Bible. Now, of course, that was the self same argument the Arians had used in the fourth century. They said, we don't believe in the Trinity because it's not in the Bible. The word isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, they, some people were using, um, mm -hmm. speaking of the will of the Father and the will of the Son and the will of the Spirit. Uh, almost as if they were three, dis three different um, ontological entities. Instead of, as John Owen pointed out, that the Son... Um, that God's indivisible will is expressed in certain ways in the Son's activity. So he can he took um, so so uh, so those I think are the problems which have arisen and have caught been the cause of a lot of, um, um, of probably misunderstanding in part, but also of um, confusion. So, so when, so when we, we talk we about the, uh, uh, I hear myself coming through, and that's funny. Uh, the, when we talk about the the wills, it seems as if there are theologians who to disagree about the the wills. Uh, some would say that the will is part of the essence, and others would put the will as a person. So uh, about being to to be a person, you have to have a will. Um, so they would say there are three wills that are in complete unity, and then your articulation is that there's actually one will that all three persons share. Um, well, that, as yeah, a, that's not my my articulation or right. my view. It's the it's the view of the United Christian Church for the last one thousand six hundred years, Rome, Orthodoxy, and Protestantism. It affirms that will is a function of nature rather than person. Hence, God has but one will, or you'd end up with tritheism. And therefore, Christ has two wills, uh, or he would not have a complete humanity and we could not be saved. Uh, and that when he talks about, uh, so in the garden, he says to the father, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, there, are two, there are two wills there working in indivisible union, one agent, one willing agent, the son, but with distinct, um, distinct, uh, but inseparable and complementary and harmonious action. So if you speak three wills in God, you're committed to one will in Christ. And the fact is then he does not have a complete humanity and we cannot be saved. And there's no gospel. We might as well go home. Wow. That's serious it is. No, yeah. it's, that's serious. It's great. And, and you've, you've yeah. talked about complementary. You've talked about participation. You talked about this cohesive nature. Now, we could we could talk about, I think, the ontological trinity and the economic trinity, and, and we'll probably get there in a second. But I, I'd be curious, could you, could you help us understand this term, this idea, perichoresis? It's something that I've been interested in. Uh, I've been reading up a little bit on, but I'd love to hear from you exactly what is perichoresis and how does it actually flesh out in Scripture? Yeah. Well, it's a, obviously a Greek term which was used to identify the mutual indwelling of the three persons of the Trinity. In fact, it was used first in talking about the person of Christ to ask how the one indivisible person of Christ could simultaneously be human. Um, now, in terms of the Trinity, what it affirms is uh, what, it, what it, it attempts to express is this, that God, as we've said, is one and indivisible. There's no separation can be made, not, not the slightest. It's one indivisible being. 
But yet that one indivisible being exists in three irreducibly distinct, um, I will use the word persons, but um, qualifying it by saying that we're not to understand that in terms of human persons, because there's at the moment several million, billion on the earth, all of whom are different shapes and sizes and go their own, own different ways and are independent. Uh, these are th three manners of subsisting, as some have argued, but person is a, is a good enough term, the best term to use. But the one indivisible being exists in these three irreducible persons, each of mm -hmm. whom is the whole God, everything that's in God, you might say, is there in the Father. Everything that in, in the immensity and infinitude of God is there in the Son. Everything that is God in terms of his immensity and infinitude is there in the Holy Spirit. Each of them distinctly are the entire infinite God. And each of them together are the one inf in infinite God. So therefore they... As one um, uh, theologian, um, Gerald Bray, wrote, they occupy the same infinite divine space. They indwell each other. Uh, they, you can't separate them, but yet they're distinct. Now, try getting your head around that. And that's a reason why I would say that no one is an expert on the doctrine of the Trinity. We are simply disciples learning and the proper response to the Trinity is worship and prayer and awe. Um, it, it's something which should humble us because we surely become aware of our, of our limitations. Okay. Yeah, I want to come back to, we talked a little bit about Arianism, and I know one of the scriptures they would have loved to quote would be uh, Psalm 2, uh, where, where it says, uh, you're my son, and today I have begotten you. And, um, and what I want to ask you is, because I, I know that the historic Orthodox Church believes in the, uh, that the son is eternally begotten. Uh, from time before time, uh, that, that there wasn't like a moment in time that Jesus began, right? Um, does Psalm 2 use begotten in a unique sort of metaphorical way that's maybe different than maybe what we read in John 3.16, where God gave his only begotten son, or some translations say one and only son? So is that a different kind of begotten? How should we understand it? Uh, no, I think it's referring to the same thing, although... One could argue that the context of the psalm, of course, is the is the royal, um, is the monarchy in Israel, and indeed it comes to expression in human history of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you have to ask, what is meant by today? It's a, it's it's something spoken by the Father to the Son, and it's to be governed by that relation, because that's the context in which it's given. I mean, Michael, uh, Matthew Bates, in his book, The Birth of the Trinity, which was published by Oxford University Press back in 2015 or so, argues that the method of interpreting the Old Testament by the apostles and the early church uh, was such that they would take passages like that and understand them as the psalmist or the prophet, as the case may be, being enabled to eavesdrop into intra-Trinitarian conversations taking place in eternity about events which were to happen in human history or about events um, eternally. So, as with any biblical passage and any statement, you can't lift it out of the context and uh, interpret it beyond the um, you know, the, 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 the context of discourse in, in which it's given. 
part of the problem has been that in the last two or three hundred years, biblical studies were, were governed by the Enlightenment and the idea that the biblical documents were to be treated just like any other human document. Um, that, that there's a way in which, of course, that is valid because they are given in human history, but they're not simply the same as any other uh, piece of uh, writing which may have been produced. Um, the, the fathers, the medievals, Reformation, people all understood that the, each passage of the Bible was part of the word of God and there was a, a unity throughout. And mm -hmm. uh, I think part of the problem has been, therefore, that so much attention has been given to the immediate historical context of the human authorship of this or that mm -hmm. biblical book. And conservative scholars have perhaps been afraid uh, to stick their neck out, necks out and depart from the, the, the prevailing post-Enlightenment consensus. Uh, but I think that that consensus, of course, with uh, development of postmodern thinking has begin, begun to erode and disintegrate. And hence, you've got people like uh, Matthew Bates and others coming on the scene and uh, uh, an, an interest back in the patristic uh, forms of biblical interpretation, which um, puts that into a, a very different perspective. Mm. It sounds like, and you can correct me if I'm misunderstanding, it sounds like you're saying it really hinges on our understanding of that word today. And rather than understanding today in terms of like this moment in history at the resurrection of Jesus, we should understand it as going back into the eternally historic plan of God that maybe became visible to us at the resurrection of Jesus. And yet, today really speaks of something that happened in eternity past within the heart and, and plan of God, something like that? Well, yes. Um, the application of that uh, passage, for example, um, by Paul, isn't it, in Acts chapter 13, verse 33, to the resurrection, has not only a validity, obviously, because it was an apostolic interpretation, but the context bears a, an analogous similarity in the sense that the resurrection marked the entrance of the incarnate Christ, our mediator, uh, into this new sphere of being, according to the spirit, as Paul puts it, um, as Corinthians 15 is elsewhere. And in Romans 1, he was um, he, he, he was. Um, declared or appointed son of God with power since the resurrection of the dead. So the the relation which which um, there is between the father and the son eternally was exemplified in terms of the resurrection of the incarnate son, our mediator and his investiture into the new sphere of lordship and authority uh, uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit in the new aeon, which was introduced by the resurrection. When we talk about the, the persons, I, I've heard some say that we can only identify the persons in Scripture by the way that they relate to creation. The Son dies on the cross. Certainly the Father and Spirit are certainly present there, but we see them taking these specific roles within kind of the economic trinity. Do you feel like, and, and the word economic just to mean for the audience watching, uh, that each person of the trinity uh, kind of works out a specific role. They together work this out uh, in different ways, but one kind of takes a primary role. The Son dies on the cross. The Spirit empowers him to get there, that kind of thing. Uh, the Spirit's not absent from the crucifixion. Uh, anyway, uh, when we talk about the roles, is that how we identify the persons? Or can the persons of the Trinity be identified uh, in Scripture ontologically? Uh, and I know that's kind of a complex question, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yes, well, if that, was, if that were the case, if the Trinity was to be known only or even primarily through his work in cre in creation and, and redemption, we'd be tying God to his creation. It would have enormous implications for the distinction between creator and creature. Wow, uh, that's profound. And moreover, 
as with modalism, it would undermine our knowledge of God because, in effect, there would be a huge question mark over whether God, we had a true knowledge of who God is because his work in creation might not necessarily be uh, revelatory of his eternal existence. A role kind of, as a word I thoroughly dislike and in that context, and it was never used until probably in the, sometime in the last generation. It, it implies something other than the particular role bearer actually is, like an actor. An actor takes on a role as a villain, but in the next movie, he's a good guy. Uh, in one movie, he's, um, he, he, you know, he's a, a king or an emperor, and the other, he's a vagabond. Um, the, the, what he does is not entirely, it's not representative of who he is, and in fact, it, it, it almost self-evidently isn't either. Well, the, there is something about that, that that word which conveys the idea of unreality uh, and uh, it, 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 it's not a very helpful term in, when applied to the Trinity. But um, even if you used a different word, then it would have the same, I think, potential damaging damage. So uh, how would you then talk about the ontological Trinity as just kind of like that follow up? How would you... Um, talk yeah. about the son's work, the spirit's work, and yeah, the and father's by, work. And just for our audience, what do you mean yeah. by ontological, the uh, essence oh, and I, being I meant, of... I meant economic, if I said oh, ontological. Oh, you did say econ economic. Yeah, so how do we understand the... the uh, economic. The economic so, the, of, so for lack of a better word, function yeah. and role and outworking yeah. of the Trinity. Yeah, so if, if you would say that, that our the word role falls short... Um, What's the know, right word? It does work. You said the, he, he, he. You said that no word would uh, quite facilitate it. Um, how, how, do, how do we then talk about it? Others, yeah. Well, the economic uh, Trinity refers, of course, to the work of the Trinity in human history. So and you'd his, be okay with role language in the economic, but not in ontological. And his revelation of himself in human history, ontological, or I think better, imminent Trinity is a, a reference to the Trinity as uh, the Trinity is eternally. Now, these are, these are simply terms coined by theologians in order to express distinctions which we perceive from our own particular perspective. Uh, there is but one Trinity, one, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one and indivisible, who is from eternity to eternity and who brought all other entities into existence. And so when we talk about the economic trinity, we're simply referring to the work of God, the trinity, in and within the creation which he brought into existence of his own sovereign will. Um, and, and we're doing it also from our own perspective as well. Uh, and when we do so, we must remember that uh, God himself transcends that realm which he brought, uh, brought into being. Now, what, how can we speak of God in himself simply by virtue of the reality and the validity and the faithfulness of his revelation of himself? We believe that God keeps his word that God has revealed himself truly to us, even though we, we know in part, well, we, we believe that he's revealed himself truly in scripture and preeminently in his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, and because of that, we can have confidence that what he makes known of, to us in history is a true reflection, a true revelation on our level and in accordance with our capacities of who he is in himself in eternity. As Calvin put it on, on one occasion, we, we hold him to be as he reveals himself to us. Okay, so I, I hear you using lots of language to to emphasize the unity of God, which is wonderful. I mean, that's obviously core Christian doctrine there. Uh, how, and, and we're struggling with, 
whether role or function or economic, any, any language tends to fall short. And I, and I know there's on some level, this is, this is just the case when you speak of the ineffable, but, but what, if you were to just try to, to simply describe what is the difference, if we can use that word, can we use that word between father, son, and Holy Spirit? Very clearly, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Uh, and then back to the Old Testament, the Lord your God is one, depending on how you understand that, but um, uh, how one is understood. But, uh, but still, the, the, the point is, God is one. So what is different? Well, there's nothing you could say different, but rather distinct. I think Calvin used that term, and eternally distinct. Yeah. Well, I, I always use the phrase that three words which are of absolutely essential in theology, which are the key to it, distinct but inseparable or indivisible. Now, human reasoning outside scripture cannot cope with that because either it reduces it to utter diversity or complete and undifferentiated unity. You've seen that in, in modern Western society, the, Reforma the Enlightenment attempted to clamp down hu on, uh, on all knowledge by human reason, bringing about an undifferentiated unity, and it, it worked itself out in politics with attempts to bring about uni unity and uniformity in so many ways, but not only with the dictatorships, but even in things like the European Union. But we've moved out of the post-enlightenment worldview into a post-modernist situation where diversity is everything. And I no need to e express how that has, has taken root. But the Bible it holds those, two, those things together, and it does so precisely because God himself is one indivisible being, but three irreducibly distinct persons. Mm -hmm. You would say distinct, not different, but it, it sounds like you wouldn't really necessarily, you'd just be very careful of describing any uh, any sort of distinction. Uh, but, but what no. would you say? I mean, because we do have to recognize distinction, and, and I think you're saying we are. You know, right. it's, it's, we see Jesus and the Holy Spirit interceding for us before the Father, and clearly it was Jesus who was incarnated. Um, and so, and, and uh, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but you would say that what we see that is distinct about them is how they interact with creation. There's not that something no. in themselves is different. The, the no. Father and the Son aren't necessarily different, but we see that they are acting differently as the Son takes this role, as mm -hmm. he works in creation, and the Father takes this role. Would that, would that be the, the, the distinctness that you see? No, I wouldn't express it that way, but I okay. would say that the Father sends the Son, never vice versa. The Father breathes out the Spirit. The Spirit does not send the Son, and the Spirit does not send the Father. So the relations in terms of the missions in the world actually reflects their eternal processions in the sense that the Father begets the Son and breathes out the Spirit um, together with the Son, as the Western Church maintains. So there are eternal distinctions there. They, you call them differences, but difference tends to highlight a disparity. And um, no, it, 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 no. Distinction is, is I think, a, a better and a safer term to use in that respect. Uh, now, those are eternal distinctions, and indeed, that is the Western doctrine of the Trinity, and indeed, the, 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 the Eastern Church as well agrees to it, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinguished by the mode of origination, begetting, spiration. Uh, reflected in the sending of the Son and the, and the um, ascending of the Spirit. Those are the ways in particular which, um, which, um, differ which distinguish uh, the three. Now, somebody might say, well, 
that's a lot of good because we don't know anything about it. And of course we don't. In fact, I preached a sermon a couple of years ago around Christmas on what I said is the most vital and relevant topic you could ever wish to know. The eternal generation of the son by the father. And I said, it's relevant because we know absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> it's relevant because it immediately tells us that there are limits to our human understanding. That before God, we must bow in humble and grateful submission. It's relevant because it tells us that in God eternally, there is life superabundantly. The, the, the God is an eternally superabundant, pulsating life. And gener Father generates the Son, which is Bavink, Dutch theologian, argued without that, that the whole idea of creation would not be possible. God would not be able to create if he did not, the Father did not generate the Son. And it, it tells us too that in creation, God himself granted life to the creatures, life which is brought about by him and is dependent upon him and is, you know, it, it, it is limited, it's creaturely life, but it comes from God. And that then when Adam sinned, he chose death. It was a choice for death. And in the sending of the Son, God offers us life, not simply on the level which you're used to, but to share his own life and to participate in the divine nature. So in that sense, the eternal generation of the Son, about which we know nothing, is in fact the most relevant thing you can possibly think about. For without it, we would not exist. So, and without so, it, there'd be no salvation. Our so, whole life depends upon it. I, I made a bit of an error in saying that that uh, certainly there's distinction within the economic trinity and how God works out through a creation, yeah. but you're saying that that distinctness goes into God, at who he, he is in himself, uh, which, what, is, which is profound. It stems from it, yes. Yeah. So when, when we talk about God in the Old Testament, um, we see uh, for sure uh, one God, but do we see those three persons appearing on the stage? Uh, I'd be really interested to, to hear your thoughts on the Trinity represented in uh, the Old Testament kind of uh, conceit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do, looking back um, with, again, realizing that as we're saying, the whole of Scripture is, 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 is unified because it comes from God. Although the original readers of it may have had some difficulty, we don't know. But let's focus simply on Genesis 1. I mentioned the God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light. God, the Spirit of God and the speech of God. You then have God creating in three distinct ways. There's direct fiat. God said, let there be light. And there was light. All he needed to do was speak and it came to be. There's actual working. God made this, that and the other. It's the idea of God actually as a workman working together uh, with, uh, and forming things. And then there's the cooperation of the created elements. God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation. Let the earth bring forth creatures. Um, it's, Genesis 1 is largely a, a description of the formation of the earth, creation having taken place in verse 1. But you have that threefold distinction there. Then in, in verse 26, when God uh, cre uh, creates the human race, he says, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Now, that was unprecedented in the rest of the chapter. It's self-deliberation by God. There was a time when people tended to say that it's a plural of majesty. I mean, here in, in Britain, in the 19th century, Queen Victoria, on one occasion, was famous to, famously reported to have said, 
we are not amused, uh, mm -hmm. royal statement. But there are, it seems, uh, grammatical and syntactical reasons why that is a weak interpretation. Some have argued that God is inviting the angels to participate in creation, but nowhere else in the Old Testament or the New are angels ever said to have been uh, participated in the creation of other entities. Um, the whole <clears throat> focus there is that it is a self-deliberation by God in the plural, creating man as male and female, a relational being and entailing the fact that God himself is relational. So there in that first chapter of Genesis, I think you have, you have hints there. You've got things like the angel of the Lord appearing on the scene throughout the Pentateuch. You've got the statements we already quoted from Psalm 2, Psalm 110, Psalm 45 and elsewhere, where there's conversation going on with, you know, within the being of God. Um, mm -hmm. Things aren't that as clear as in the New Testament. Israel was surrounded by pagan tribes. There was a whole smorgasbord of deities on offer in the ancient Near East. They were in constant danger of going off into worshipping foreign um, beings. And so the need was to ram home very, very effectively, and particularly uh, because of the the idolatry which came upon them and the exile which followed ram home upon them the fact that God is one and he is unrivaled uh, and that lesson was very well learned but it, it's as we as the revelation develops as the history of redemption goes on that um, in order to deliver his people God himself appears in person in his son who is one with him from eternity and then pours out the spirit of the subsequent to the resurrection and ascension. So it's a progressive revelation, but mm. one in which the roots on, and, the, and the, really the germ of it is found right at the very beginning in the very first chapter, even the first paragraph of the Bible. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's great. That's so, great. So, I think we have time for have time one for more question uh, today. And I, and I want to, we've kind of, we started on creation. You really worked through the Old Testament just now. And I, and I want to look to sort of the center of human history and the cross. And specifically, I'm, I'm curious how your understanding of the oneness of the Trinity affects your understanding, particularly of the doctrine of propitiation. And the reason I ask that is because the way propitiation is often characterized by its critics is you got angry father mad at his kids and Jesus says no 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 don't do that you know don't hurt them hurt me instead and the father says oh, okay that'll that'll do and 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 then people will point to they'll literally point to Isaiah 53:10 and they'll say look please the father to bruise him and so and, and so they'll uh, they'll look at at the scripture in this way but I I have a feeling that wouldn't agree with your understanding of propitiation. So I'm curious how, how you would, uh, how your understanding of the oneness of the Trinity affects your understanding of propitiation. Yes, well, that view, which I agree is a commonly held one, would, would, would create those tritheistic problems we mentioned earlier. No, we read in, in, the, New, in the Bible, God loved the world in this way. He gave his only son. Uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Uh, this, um, God showed forth his love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, and, and so in Ephesians, in love, he foreordained us to be adopted in sons. It's all three persons of the Trinity actively and inseparably engaged in every aspect of our redemption. So that on the cross, it was it was God himself who took that penalty in his son, according to the flesh, in his humanity and therefore experienced human suffering, human death, human burial. 
So yeah, so it's it, it's not that the, the 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 father is unwilling and angry, and the son meekly submits and is treated mm-hmm. like a bystander to whom abuse is meted out. It's that the whole Trinity identified self with us in our human uh, predicament and in the son now the son according to his flesh in his humanity suffered and died um, and the father and the spirit were one with him in doing so that's great. That's great. Hey, so as we wrap up the show today, uh, thank you again so much for coming on. It was an honor to have you. Uh, as we talk about the Trinity, you're, you're coming out with a book on the Holy Spirit. I know at the beginning of the show, you also talked about your book on systematic theology. Uh, as people are studying the the subject of the Trinity, uh, what resources have you uh, produced that would help them in their journey in discovering uh, this kind of this wondrous thing that is God? <laughs> thing that is God? <laughs> Poor choice wow. of words. Jeez, Come on, Josh. this wondrous doctrine that is the Trinity. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> um, that's a very Feel free big... to correct heresy on yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You can, you can slap me upside the theological <laughs> head. That's fine. question to ask. I would, um, it, it, for serious readers, I would take them to Augustine's treatise on the Trinity or to his, if they have it, um, his... His sermons on the Gospel of John, particularly the 20th sermon on John, or uh, particularly Calvin on um, Institutes, Book 1, Chapters um, 12 and 13. Um, My colleague, on on the lighter note um, than, than those, my colleague here, Mike Reeves, has produced a book on delighting in the Trinity, and I think um, closer to home where you are, Fred Sanders in uh, Biolo, isn't it, um, has written, I think it's one that's called as the Deep Things of God or How the Trinity Changes Everything, that kind of thing. Those would, those would go well. Um, yeah. Well, that's that's it for us today. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. Make sure to hit the subscribe button. Make sure to like the video as we're coming out with content just like this, and you don't want to miss upcoming episodes. We mentioned it before. I mean, we've got all over the theological spectrum, guys like Jeff Durbin, guys like Todd White, guys like uh, The Bible Project with Tim Mackey. Lots of uh, programs coming out in the next couple of months. Don't forget this Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, there will be a debate between Dr. Leighton Flowers and Dr. Dr. Pastor Joel Webbin. Uh, they're going to be debating soteriology, so make sure you tune in. That's going to start at 7. It's going to be a little bit early, but it's going to be a longer debate platform, so it's going to continue on through our normal live stream time. If you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, go ahead and shoot me an email at josh at theremnantradio.com. If you'd like to show up uh, in person to hear that discussion, we might have limited seating uh, as Corona has limited us and how we can seat people. So if you want to come to that, we'll, we'll probably open the studio for you. Uh, anyway, we'll see you guys next time, uh, Monday night, eight, well, I guess not 8.30, Monday night, 7 p.m. See you then. Blessings.